and they exist. We talk about them all the time. High Bite is one of those technologies. They, it's not like these have to be created. They already exist. The reason most people don't know about them is because the organizations who have a vested interest in the status quo control nearly all of the messaging. This, I'm gonna do something a little different this week, all right? So um, I, I've talked about uh, John Rinaldi from Real Time Automation uh, several times. So guy I have a huge amount of respect for. Um, John does a, um, a newsletter um, that he sends out, I think it's every quarter, and the new newsletter just came out, okay? And in his newsletter, he has an article in there he wrote called Rapid Digitalization of Manufacturing, question mark. Welcome to Fantasy Island. What say you? And it, it, literally, this just got sent out to our team this morning. Tanya sent this out to our whole engineering team, and I read it like 45 minutes before we came on. And I said, you know, I really should like read this, and let's, let's answer it. some questions that he raises here, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and read the article. Zach is going to include the link to the – there's a longer article that he wrote, a blog post on his website. Zach will include that for you guys. It's actually in here, but I'm going to read it real quick. So John says, I often wonder if, uh, real quick, hold on. Uh, Rinaldi is also the same guy who I met with a few years ago where we had this holy war discussion between MQTT and OCUA. His initial position was MQTT is not the future of digital, of IOT infrastructure, uh, OPCUA is. And then he posted his Mia Culpa last year. So I, I'm, it's the same guy when I say Rinaldi. Very, very highly respected guy in the community. I am one of those people who has the utmost respect for John. So, so he, he, the article goes like this. I often wonder if I'm a square peg in a round hole. I see things differently than many in our industry do. And honestly, it sometimes bothers me. The other day I was looking at the agenda for a Zoom conference and the abstract for the keynote address said in part, quote, it's time that manufacturers adopt rapid digitalization, end quote. That stopped me in my tracks. Here's the CEO of a Fortune 500 company saying something so utterly half-baked and ludicrous that I was dumbfounded. Uh, maybe he sees something I can't see, and that's the reason he's CEO of a Fortune 500 monstrous company, and I have a tiny company with almost as many chickens as people. Don't get me wrong, I believe in digitalization, and he does. The objectives are as admirable, admirable as they are ambitious. Establishing Ethernet as the sole physical layer um, I disagree. That is not the that is not a an objective of rapid digitalization. But I get his point. Establishing a single communication standard to support everything from sensor to cloud communications. Again, that's an absolute statement. That isn't entirely true. Uh, decoupling hardware platforms from software pl applications. Absolutely true. Reshaping IT and OT departments. Absolutely true. Enabling machine learning and artificial intelligence at the edge such that data can be processed and responded to quickly. I think that's all admirable. And we agree, John. Where I part ways with many is that I think it is very difficult, if not near impossible, to disrupt the interlocking ecosystems of the major suppliers, distributors, and integrators, as well as their customers who have operations designed for compatibility with those ecosystems. Quickly replacing all that with an entirely new industrial ecosystem of new suppliers, new distributors, and new integrators adept at deploying new industry 4.0 tools, processes, and methodologies is a fantasy. Here's what is needed to make this fantasy a reality. So before I go through his points, it is not a fantasy. This is the real world. It is happening today. It's been happening for the last seven years. He is absolutely right when he says that if what you want to do is disrupt the interlocking ecosystems of major suppliers, distributors, and integrators, as well as their customers who have operations designed for compatibility with those ecosystems is going to be hard. He's absolutely right. But I, I want to comment here, all right? Those large Fortune 500 companies know it's hard too. And so there's basically three types of companies out there right now, manufacturers, okay? Manufacturer number one started in the fourth industrial revolution, and they don't need to digitally transform. Okay, they have been able to build their plant from the ground up without having to use the current ecosystem of major suppliers, distributors, and integrators. They pick different suppliers. They don't use distributors, 
and they use the right integrators. Okay. That's company number one, the industry 4.0 company. By the way, they're kicking, they're kicking the market's ass. The vast majority of those companies do not allow you to mention their name. They don't want to be known well yet. Their competitive advantage in the market is that they have gone ahead and used disruptive technology and then didn't tell anybody about it. They just gloat over the bottom line. Okay. Now, there are some companies who are sharing that technology. Tesla happens to be one of them, which is why we mentioned Tesla, because Tesla allows you to talk about their technology. They give away their patents. They're sharing it with the world. But most of the other industry 4.0 companies, especially the ones that we work with, do not give us permission to use their name. We are not allowed to mention them. We're not allowed to mention their technology. But I assure you, <laughs> those companies exist. And many of them in the, are in the Fortune 500 and Global 100. Here's company number two. Company number two is the existing Industry 3.0 company who A, has either created the will within their organization to get their current operations to digitally transform. That's only one out of 12 companies, by the way. So when I talk about this, when we talk to these huge companies, 11 out of 12, we walk away going, they're either getting bought or they're going broke. Okay, one out of 12, one out of 12 is the company who can get the organization to change, right? So that's organization number two. Organization number three is the large organization who has said, we can't get our current manufacturing operations to change. So what we're doing is creating a whole new business unit that is our industry 4.0 business unit. And there, that's the company where, where, that was going to be making all the money for us when the industry 3.0 company goes broke. And these companies, by the way, these companies are the biggest names on the planet, okay? So when we, the companies we're working with who have created this whole other business unit because they couldn't get, their manufacturing operations are one of the 11 of 12, those companies have created a whole new unit no one else thought knows about. It's all on the down low. It's all confidential. It's all obfuscated in the prospectus reports every quarter. And it's the future of their business when the industry 3.0 manufacturer goes broke. So that's the third company, okay? There's really a fourth one, and that's one that's either going to get bought or go broke, okay? But we know that. So let's talk about John's points here real quick. Number one, John says that the only way this is going to work is manufacturers first would have to come to believe that the benefits of digitalization, substantial savings, profits, and efficiencies are actually achievable Results are mixed on that right now. This is not true. He's right. They do have to come to believe the benefits um, are actually achievable. The results are not mixed. There is a prevailing belief in the market that results are mixed, but the results are not mixed. If you use the, st the correct steps to digital transformation, you pick the right partners, you have the right strategy, you use the right technology, you're going to succeed. Okay. We do not have an example of a client who has adopted the right strategy, is using the right technology, and has partnered with the right people who have failed. We don't have that example, okay? John's wrong, the results are not mixed, but there are organizations who can't get out of their own way. And, that, and those are the companies who are failing with bullet point number one. Bullet point number two, he says manufa manufacturers would have to be willing to reinvent their organizations. Absolutely. They got to restructure and reorganize the responsibilities, roles, and processes of both IT and OT. Industry 4.0 companies start with IT OT convergence. It's already been done. They, the company gets created with IT and OT merged together. Okay. So they don't have that problem. The company who successfully, that one in 12, who successfully goes from industry 3.0 to 4.0, they merge IT and OT and they do it through strong leadership by rooting out the people who are preventing you from doing that convergence, okay? And the third company is an industry 4.0 company, the third type, okay? Number three, the tools for digitalization must be available. Well understood and standardized, the digital transformation cannot happen without the platforms, software, and tools supporting it, and they exist. We talk about them all the time. Highbyte is one of those technologies. They, it's not like these have to be created. They already exist. The reason most people don't know about them is because the organizations who have a vested interest in the status quo 
control nearly all of the messaging. Okay. But if you look at the our industry 4.0 Discord server who has more than 1,200 something members of like minded thinkers, they're not getting their messaging from Rockwell and they're not getting it from Siemens and they're not getting it from these guys. They're getting it from the community. Okay. I say this all the time. You want to know why we're popular content creators? Because we say things everybody else already thinks. That's it. I come on here and I'm, I say things that all these members already think. They already believe these things. And it's a moth to a flame. The difference is Rockwell, Siemens, the big companies, they cannot use money to get me to say something they want me to say. And they use money to get their distributors to say the right thing. They use money and influence to get their partners to say the right thing, to get the OPC Foundation to say the right thing, the standard boards to say the right thing. They can't do that with us, okay? Number four, vendors would have to provide the open hardware systems, virtual containers, and operating systems to power edge devices. Already exists, John. It's already there. We talk about it all the time. Here's just one example. Just one example sitting on my desk. There's a bunch more examples sitting behind me, okay? Software vendors would have to provide the plethora of open application tools to build the apps. They already exist. We talk about them all the time. Why do you believe that the fastest growing piece of industrial software on the planet is what? You can ask anybody. What is the fastest growing piece of industrial software on the planet? Ignition. It is Ignition, without a doubt. Ignition's market share since 2012 went from less than 1% to almost a third in the United States. Why? Unlimited pricing model, open architecture. It's a platform for solving problems. It already exists, John. Okay. Last, certification standards would have to be in place to govern how these open systems interact and exchange IO and data. They, those emerging certifications and standards bodies, are, they are coming out now. Is the OPC Foundation going to be the governing standards body for the IIoT infrastructure? The answer is not unless they change the way they do things. Okay. Is ISA going to be the standards body long term? The answer is not unless they change the way they do things. But there are emerging, there are emerging certifications and standards bodies who are handling all this work for us. Okay. So he says, all this is to say a bridge too far. The interlocking ecosystems of trade organizations, vendors, and user organizations are going to slow the adoption of any technologies and processes that disrupt the prevailing order. I agree with you 100%, John. There is too much money at stake. The ecosystems are too integrated and organizations just won't change fast enough for a real tipping point that leads to massive change. But then again, I'm not the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. I'm just some Wisconsin cheesehead saying the emperor has no clothes. Am I right? You tell me. I wrote a more complete article about this on our website. Zach, please share the link with the community. I'm telling John, his premise is 100% true. Everything that he is saying is absolutely true. These things absolutely have to happen. Here's the difference. John is a victim of his first, his second paragraph. The other day I was looking at the agenda for some Zoom conference and the abstract for the keynote address said in part, stop going to those conferences. Start getting your information about the industry from, from people who are not beholden to the, the current order, okay? If you go to ARC or CSIA or any, you know, any of these shows, those shows are the top marketing ad spend for those shows are the companies who have a vested interest in the status quo, okay? All right, so let, let me say this. John is absolutely right in his premise. The difference is all those points that John laid out, that's not fantasy, that's reality, that's today. That's what we've been doing for the last seven years. It's what this community has been doing. We are literally training. I had a, I had a, I'm going to make two points here. Number one, we had a call with a really, really large company that's building a brand new industry 4.0 facility, ground up, huge investment, billion dollars, okay? And they want us to be the architects for the solution. And they did all the normal stuff. How big are you guys? How many developers do you have? And, you know, our company is not that big. You know, we're a little over 40 people in, to in total permanent manpower through all of our partnerships. Okay. And they said, well, how do you scale up? And my answer is we're training the community that we're going to leverage 
And then I went to the Discord server and said, we literally are, the we have 16 graduates who are coming out of this step one training who go through the same th training our engineers go through. We are literally creating a community of people that are going to solve these problems. Because one of the barriers we have to overcome is the traditional integrator model, right? So I, I answered that question to him. Number two, over the weekend, Zach flew out here to Dallas. We shot content all weekend. One of the videos we shot was AWS IoT versus Azure IoT, okay? So what is the difference? Most people don't know. They, what is the difference? AW, you have two, you have an example of the open strategies that John says you got to have. And then you've got an example of not so open strategies that are holding us back. If you compare Azure IoT to AWS, there's really no comparison. If you're using Azure IoT, you're creating more work for yourself. It doesn't mean that you can't create an industry 4.0 infrastructure or an IoT infrastructure using the technology we promote using Azure. Okay, you can but it is a heavier engineering lift than it is with AWS. Why? Because Microsoft has a vested strategic interest in AMQP over MQTT. They own AMQP. So from a business perspective, they are not going to promote a competing broker technology. Doesn't mean that they're not gonna support it because the market's demanding it, but they're not going to, they're gonna make it easier to use AMQP, number one. Number two, Microsoft is an OPC partner, okay? They are a member, they're partners with the OPC Foundation. They're members of the OPC Foundation. They're also Rockwell Automation Partners, okay? So Azure, Microsoft has a vested interest in pushing our Rockwell solutions. They have a vested interest in pushing the OPC UA data model. AWS doesn't have any of that. AWS supports Sparkplug B out of the box. Azure does not. Azure gives you an SDK that'll allow you to build one if you want. That was the compromise, right? That's the compromise they have with their partners is that, hey, we'll give you an SDK so you can build it if you want to, but we're not gonna make it easy for you. That is an example of what John's talking about here, okay? That is, that's what John's talking about.